Right. Well, let's get started today. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that here in Salt Lake City, we are located on land which is named for the Ute tribe and is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. We recognize and respect the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and our traditional homelands. Additionally, we are utilizing the technology of Zoom, which is headquartered in San Jose, California on the traditional lands of the Ohlone peoples. We pay our respects to the current and past elders of all these land, of, <laughs> of all these peoples and lands for their continued stewardship. We also must acknowledge that the prosperity of what we call the United States has depended on the labor of enslaved peoples. And rather than simply speak these words, we encourage all of us to consider donating to organizations like the ACLU, Black Lives Matter, Campaign Zero, and the NAACP. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad you've logged on and joined us here in the virtual space, whether you're here with us in the live version of this or you're watching this later in a recorded version. Uh, my name is Brooke Horsch. Um, I am a white woman with shoulder length silver hair, lots of silver. Um, I'm wearing a pair of glasses that are clear and I'm in my home office and I have on a striped shirt. I'm the executive director of Utah Presents, which is a multidisciplinary presenter at the University of Utah. And today we're thrilled to convene our third session in the Artists Elevated Discussing Equity and Creativity in the Mountain West series. Artists Elevated was inspired by the brilliant and collaborative work of Creating New Futures, a national conversation led by dance artists of color from across the country. And as we witnessed those conversations, we realized we needed to both expand the conversation to address other disciplines and contract it to be specific to our region, the Mountain West. So you can find all the information about the sessions, both the ones that have already happened and future sessions at the Utah Presents website. And we'd love for you all to help us spread the word so as many folks as possible can listen to the sessions either recorded or join us for future live sessions. I'd like to give some um, thanks to our key partners in developing this program, the Utah Division of Arts and Museums, the College of Fine Arts at the University of Utah, the Salt Lake City Arts Council, and Utah Humanities. All of those partners help make this programming happen, particularly by valuing the artists involved and helping us to pay them for their participation, time, and labor. Okay, now for a few Zoom logistics. So we are in a webinar format. Um, we'll start with introductions from our panelists and then have a conversation led by our moderator. For the last part of the session, we will share um, any questions that you have so if you think of things while we're in conversation, feel free to put those questions at any time in the Q&A section. Now the Q&A section in the webinar version of Zoom is a little different in, than the chat area. Yeah, so you can find that Q&A session at the bottom hand of your screen on the right hand side. And once you post it there, we'll be able to see it. If it's a question for a specific panelist, just make sure to let us know that you wanna hear specifically from that a certain panelist. Otherwise, we will present the question to all of the panelists at the last part of the session. I also wanna encourage everyone to join us in positive affirmations. I think one of the hardest shifts to the virtual space is the lack of auditory affirmation from the audience. So if something one of the panelists says resonates with you, type it in that chat section. Give them um, a, a way to see that you agree applaud for them um, visually, and we'd really appreciate that. Finally, I wanna let everyone know that the session is being recorded. Uh, and so you can check back at the website uh, to find the link at if, um, once we get it all cleaned up and ready and available. So now I'm really pleased to turn the rest of the time over to our moderator, Kirsten Chavez. Kirsten was born in Albuquerque, New Mexico, but spent most of her formative years in Kuala Lumpur. She received a Bachelor of Music degree with honors from New Mexico State University and a Master of Music degree in Performance and the Performer's Certificate from the Eastman School of Music. She currently resides here in Salt Lake City and is an Associate Professor in the University of Utah's School of Music. In addition to being recognized as one of the definitive Carmens of today, Kirsten has also garnered success in modern operas such as the recent chamber opera, We Shall Not Be Moved with Opera Philadelphia. Kirsten, I'm so glad to have you here with us today and thank you so much for doing this. It's all thank yours. 
Thank you so much, Brooke. What a great honor to be here. As Brooke mentioned, my name is Kirsten Chavez, and I am a Hispanic woman with nice, dark, uh, Carmen-like hair, which I did on purpose. I'm here in my home office, and you will occasionally see my dog, Luna Marie, uh, stepping in and out. She runs the house, so she basically goes where she likes. It is such a great honor to be here and to be the moderator for such incredibly talented panelists. I'm very excited to share with you um, all that they have to offer um, by introducing certain questions and starting the conversations rolling. But without further ado, I'd like to ask our uh, panelists to introduce themselves. And I'd like to start with Liz Lampson, please. Hello, my name is Liz Lamson. Thank you so much for having me. This is a really special opportunity and I'm happy to be here. Um, so I am a Korean African-American woman. I have a kind of tan brown skin and a large curly Afro, black Afro. Um, and I have a uh, Sephora lipstick. That's kind of a reddish pink. <laughs> um, for those of you who are uh, struggle visually. Um, anyway, to introduce myself otherwise, um, non-visually, um, I am a musician and a performer and a, I do quite a few things, but uh, I do visual art and, um, but I'm a classical string bass player uh, I graduated from the BYU School of Music in 2008, and um, I also am a songwriter and singer and guitarist. Um, so I have an alter ego. Her name is Lizzie Luna, and I have a children's music and movement program called Yoga Storytime and Songs, and um, where we I tell stories and play original music and sing and we incorporate yoga into all of that and I do that with kids and so that's really fun. Um, on the bass, I am a member of the Ballet West Orchestra. Um, unfortunately, because of COVID, we're not performing much at all right now, but uh, we shall see what the future holds for our orchestra. Um, also, I'm on the board of directors of a new organization called the Utah Black Artists Collective, which is a nonprofit that uh, elevates the work and talent of Black creatives throughout the state. Um, I also have become recently active with the um, Black Lives Matter Utah as uh, helping with the, a new project that's developing. It's the Utah Black History Museum. So I'm currently painting a bus that will become a mobile moving museum. Um, so look for that, it's gonna be really cool. Um, otherwise, um, I, I, I love to cross stitch <laughs> and I am a mother of five boys ages, between the ages of one and 10. That's me. Thank you so much, Liz. Good grief. I don't know how anyone juggles all of that. That's fantastic. Um, I'd like to go next to Lita. Hello, everyone. I am Lita Harris Newstetter. She, hers. I am a mixed race black woman, say honey colored skin, maybe. I've got kind of a messy, messy hairdo, short on the side, long on the top. Um, I've got a super cool like 70s mirrored wall hanging in my background that I found at a thrift store for $10 and I was really <laughs> excited about it. You probably won't see my dog, but she's under my feet. Her name's Annabelle and she goes everywhere with me. Um, so my, I am pretty scattered. It's been my blessing and my curse. I, um, when I went to undergrad where I went at Occidental College, um, when I had the choice of studying psychology or music, I decided to study psychology. I felt like if I studied music, it would ruin it for me. It would make it too, too much like a job or it would just kind of kill the passion. I was misguided, but that's what I thought. So, um, so my career was in mental health as a therapist and I did music as a hobby. A lot of music theater, singing with jazz bands, that kind of thing. And then 
when I could see that I was going to get burned out with that. And I was spending a lot of time infusing music and arts into therapy and realizing that a lot of the conversations I was having as a therapist were the same conversations I was learning as a performer and as an actor about building empathy, communication skills, emotional insight. It was, it was all kind of the same thing. And so I decided to open my own business where I could fuse the arts and mental health and, um, be more on the creative side so I didn't get burned out. So I opened my business, Metamorphosis Performing Arts Studio, about 12 years ago. And I teach classes there, music classes, acting classes. I also run a private practice as a therapist. Um, and I infuse life skills, confidence building, empathy building, insight building, all of that into the arts that I do and in my private studio, but also contracting with the schools around the valley. Um, I'm pretty, my scatteredness, unfortunately, like I don't, I perform all the time. I'm called into other people's projects constantly. I've uh, recorded some originals for different CD compilations here and there, but I've never focused my energies enough to actually just create like my own album or my own project. So that is my next chapter of my life is trying to um, graciously maybe say no to a couple of these other things for other people and learn to focus a little bit more on at least getting something of my own created <laughs> so that I can say, yeah, here's my album. Wonderful, Lita. Thank you so, so much. Can't wait to hear more about your stories as well. Um, Carlos Coco Garcia, por favor. Gracias, thanks for the invitation. I'm the bald hair guy. Uh, I'm here at my house, a uh, little home off, home studio that I have, where I spend a lot of time. <laughs> Recently, I'm original from Venezuela, South America, and I've been in the United States for 24 years now. It's been a great journey. It's my home now. Uh, it's been a great journey. And I, I came here as uh, for the living tradition. I remember my cousin moved here, and my dad is a great harp player. My dad, they invited our group, Venezuela Cantando, to come to the living tradition in 1995. Wow. And I'm one of the, I mean, I, I remember that being my, 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 my first uh, show that we did here in the United States. And then since then, I, I have, every year we have performed the living traditions. I've done a lot of stuff here in the city and very blessed to, you know, like I was in the closing ceremonies with, I joined uh, the closing ceremonies with Gloria Stephan, was uh, one of the percussionists uh, because they needed uh, some uh, players and they call our band uh, back at the time it was called Mambo Jambo with uh, Ricardo Romero and another friends, uh, great musicians too. So yeah, I've been very blessed. Uh, Salt Lake City has been my home for 24 years and I finally working in my first album, eight songs uh, already completed and two more to go. So there's a couple in YouTube already. You can uh, find out on their Coco Garcia. And then by this uh, no, end November or December, I should have my album ready. So I'm very excited about that. Coco, bravissimo. That's wonderful Thank news. You. Thank you so much. And Thank finally, you. Isaiah, can you tell us a little bit about you? Yes, hello everybody. Um, I am an African-American male and I have um, medium brown complexion, um, thick sort of salt and pepperish beard. Uh, I'm not old, old, but <laughs> some salt and pepper in my beard there. And uh, I'm wearing a kufi cap in honor of African heritage. It's not necessarily of religious significance, but uh, it is a throwback to my African roots as I am the descendants of African enslaved people. So I wear that for that. I'm wearing a green shirt to symbolize life because um, in this time we, we need life and love and love is life. Um, I am a homeboy, a homegrown boy of Salt Lake City. I was born and raised here. Um, I'm the son of the city you might say and I am a pianist. I, I describe myself as a soul musician who happens to play jazz. I've been playing uh, piano since I was three years old and um, started with like a little toy piano and then I, you know, graduated to the keyboard and then from the keyboard to the organ and then from the organ to the piano and then from the piano to the roads and I've just been 
playing, you know, nonstop since then. Um, and then I graduated from the University of Utah in 2010 with a bachelor's in composition, music composition. So I'm also a composer, a beat maker, a song producer, a songwriter. Uh, currently, um, in recent years, I have co-founded uh, a, a Latin jazz fusion-ish band, if you will, called The Mix with Jazzy Olivo, who is making a name for herself in the music community here in the Valley. And uh, I'm also currently working on individual music for my own solo project that I'm gonna release hopefully some point next year. And um, yeah, I teach adjunct piano at Westminster and also at Weber State. I did one year at the University of Utah as an adjunct. And um, yeah, I teach jazz piano and then I write songs and then I make beats and then I play gigs everywhere. So that's pretty much me in a nutshell. Wow, Isaiah, thank you so, so much. I just feel like I'm in uh, my living room with my friends who are all extremely talented. And I, I just wanna ask some questions um, and I'll start out by asking maybe a, a one of you, um, but if the others of you wanna chime in or have something to add, please let's make it an organic and wonderful and, and enlightening conversation. So just to start off, I'm gonna start with Lita and say, Lita, what, what do you feel you've, you've faced as either a challenge or as an advantage by living in the Mountain West with regard to trying, trying to bring your art out into the world? Do you feel like there were specific challenges or maybe advantages to being in this part of the country? Well, I have, um, I, don't, I don't know if this is an advantage to being this part of the country or just being in a community that is, you know, I'm in, I'm in Boise, Idaho. And so um, we're, we're not a big, we're not a big play. I mean, we're, we're, we're not a small town anymore, but, but it's, it, it, it's easy to get connected enough um, that people start to know people. So I'll tell you a little bit of a story that I think to me kind of speaks to that when I, when I, the times when I've been frustrated and wanted to leave this area. And then I think about situations like the one that, that happened that I thought this probably never would have happened somewhere else. And maybe it would have happened somewhere else. But so um, take your mind back in time. This is gonna reveal some of my age. <laughs> That's okay though, I'm down for it. Um, this was 1998. Boys to Men were touring, <laughs> right? Boys to Men. Yes. Um, I had just finished graduate school, and so, and I had studied social work, so I'd spent a lot of time with a deep dive into systemic racism and a lot of that kind of problematic stuff. So I was leaving the country for a while because I was fed up, and just wanted to go be around Black and Brown people. And there are very few of us here in Boise, Idaho. Right. So um, I had I bought a one way ticket to an island uh, off the coast of Honduras and I was just gonna go live there for a while. And um, after I'd been moving all, all week, sweaty, gross, hadn't showered, you know, everybody knows what moving is like. That's what I was in the middle of. And then at one point I remembered that I'd left all of my food in the refrigerator at my apartment. And I really wanted to get my full cleaning deposit back. So I had some friends drive me over so I could empty out all the food. And there on the door was a note because this was back before cell phones a note on my door in all caps, Lita, where are you? We're opening for boys to men at 6.30 tonight. Where are you? <laughs> and it was people from my band trying to find me. No cell phones, like I said, there's no way to get a hold of anybody. At this point, I have about 45 minutes before that concert's supposed to start. So I race back to my friend's house, literally tearing through my boxes to try to find something that I could wear on stage, find this like velvet dress. Can't put on can't fix this, no showering, but I grab a handful of Vaseline, rub it in my hair because I'm like, well, even if it's messy, but like if it's shiny, oh it'll look intentional. Like, I'm, like I meant to do that. <laughs> so we drive, we're driving, the closer we get to the, to the amphitheater, then we hit traffic. So I am in a full panic. Somehow <laughs> we managed to get around, get to the back door. I also had grabbed a boa, this huge feather boa. Like every move I made, this boa molted feathers into the air. But I jump out of the car and I'm racing for the back door. And right as I see the security guard start to come out, like, what are you doing? He, he opens the door and he says, we've been waiting for you. 
and I run in, the rest of the bandmates are huddled behind the stage, passing down the, a bottle of wine. Because this was, this was actually not a band. This was a complete improv musical experiment. There was no band. We had played several times in, this, uh, in a bar and every single time it was a different configuration of musicians because we were all just improving. So there was no band. He had simply collected anybody he could who was available. So there were like six of us. We'd never played together because there were no songs. It was 100% improv. <laughs> and I step out on stage, you know, there's like, I, I think it was about 9,000 people with their ravey glow sticks. The music starts. Oh One of the women comes and says, what do I sing? Why do I sing? She's whispering to me. I'm like, you got to just make something up. There are no songs. Make it up, you know, make it up in front of 9,000 people. It was a, it was a thrilling experience to say the least. And I just felt like that is, that's the kind of thing that happens when I live in a place like this, yeah. you know? Yeah. Um, so I don't know, maybe that could have happened somewhere else. But to me, I felt uh, like opportunities like that. That's why I stay where I am. That's pretty special, Lita, I have to say. And boy, you must have felt like you were really alive that day. <laughs> wow, I'm so glad you stayed, darling, because you're clearly doing amazing things. And, and I'd like to ask Coco if you can weigh in. I'm, I'm so curious, how is it that you've managed to thrive with salsa here in the Mountain West? How, how do you think that was made possible? Well, I, I actually, when I moved here, there was a, a band called Salsa Brava, the premier salsa band here in Utah. Salsa Brava and Tony Santiller was the, you know, the, one of the uh, pioneers on that. So I joined Salsa Brava when I was 19. Uh -huh. uh, I couldn't get into the club. I remember I sneak in at the Sefri <laughs> Club. I have to admit it one time, <laughs> being like 20 years old at the Sefri Club. But they sneak me in and uh, I was one of the uh, last singers before they split up. And then after that, there were other bands like Mambo Jambo, Ritmo Caliente. So I was always in the loop on, on the salsa bands in town. There was always one or two in town, but they split up a lot. And then I, I decided like 12 years ago, I decided I'm going to do my own band because they just keep splitting out. Yeah. And I, I took the, the bull by the horns, like I said, you know, and gathered people and, and I've been playing since then. And it's been great because Pretty much being in the West, I don't have a lot of competition, I have to say, but uh, no. there in Idaho, there's not a lot of salsa bands in, you know, uh, Nevada, a very few. So Denver, a few, um, and I've been lucky, you know, to- uh, So you, you, have a little, a, you have a little bit of a, a monopoly on the salsa, huh? I have to admit that, uh, yeah, I do. Great, hey. But it's great now that I'm doing my own music and it's coming up great and it's beautiful and people are liking it a lot. What I've done already, I have three songs in YouTube and they're great. great okay, great. well, maybe you should share in the chat how we can uh, how we can get a hold of those songs because yeah. we're going to want to hear Coco Garcia, them. yeah, Coco Garcia Salsa or, yeah, I will put a little chat here in a minute. Super, and and I know Lita's going to want to put that on her radio program, so we got to we gotta get together on it. Yeah, I, I was there last year uh, opening, um, we did a Latin festival uh, in Boise, Idaho. Oh, wow, in Boise, you were there. Oh my gosh, see, it's a, yeah. such a small world is what yeah. we're talking about. So um, Liz, tell us, tell us, I would like to hear from you. I know that you're, you've just been in this area, the Salt Lake area for about three years, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. So I'm curious, do you, I would like to know a little bit about what you've experienced with, a, with regard to the black American, black artist kind of experience. Do you feel like this is uh, an area that is open to, to Black artists particularly, or is that something that we need to work on? Oh, I, sometimes, sometimes I feel that it is and sometimes I, I wonder. Um, so I spend a lot of time in the classical music scene and in the classical music world, um, there are in America anyway, there are very few um, African-American classical orchestral musicians, string players. Um, I mean, we, we're, yeah, on the bass. I, you might even find more on the bass because the, there's the jazz element okay. though. So that's kind of 
there's there's definitely a connection between the African American community and the jazz community. So there's some intersect there's an intersection there. Um, anyway, I um, I I have felt very welcome actually, and I think um, Coco brings up a really good point that when you you know he's saying there are not a lot of salsa bands here, um, and then you don't have as much competition and. And so there are a lot of advantages to being a minority or being unique yeah. and people seek out your perspective. And I, I personally think that, that having um, in any organization, I feel that diversity, having a diverse group um, in your audience or uh, your employees can only benefit you. I really feel that um, that diversity of thought is a good thing and it can inspire it, it can it can expand your horizons of thinking and um and people can inspire each other in new ways and, and introduce new thoughts that they may not have before um as far as like uh being a minority though here in the orchestra scene i i, I was going to share that kind of an interesting experience that i had which was um when I, when I moved here and I took my first orchestra audition um, held here. And typically orchestra auditions are held completely blind. Um, you want to be judged on your playing and your skill and nothing else. Right, so in other words, you'd, you'd normally audition behind a screen or something yeah. like that so the judges can't see you, right? Exactly. Yeah. And that, that was the case for this audition. So I, I went in and I, I really feel like I played my best audition, the best audition of my life. I prepared wow. so well. I did it went really well, wow. and um, and I I went through round two and and then was sitting and waiting for them to come back down with results and um, they had trouble deciding between me and another person, and what I learned later is that uh, there were two spots open and I did end up getting a seat which is great, but I did not get the principal position that I was aiming for, and. Um, Later, I was talking with one of the adjudicators and interestingly enough, I learned that they had trouble deciding, they we were really struggling to choose who to pick for the principal position. And so they unveiled our identities and they looked over, they learned about who we were and they looked at our resumes and such. And then in the end, they gave it to the white male. And I'm not saying that like he wasn't worthy of it at all. And I think that he was. Um, and he, he, we were, you know, we were both like neck and neck, but, um, it's one of those moments where you, where I just couldn't help but wonder, like, had it been completely blind, had they not revealed who we were? And if you have a black woman standing next to a white man, you know, even subconsciously, could that have influenced their decision right. filling the position? Um, and when I was speaking with one of the adjudicators, um, he mentioned to me, like, you know, we were looking for not just playing ability, but qualities in a, in a leader, you know, leadership qualities. And, um, and that just kind of like, you know, it, it just brings, it brings up the fact that in a room full of people, if you don't know anything about the individuals, if you just see what they look like, you can, it's, it's really interesting how people will migrate towards um, specific individuals, um, turn to them as, leader, as leaders, um, simply because of how they appear. Yeah, um, well, and that's basically the defini definition of racism that, um, that we're dealing with in, in the sense that a lot of it is overt, but so much of it, I, you know, a lot of Americans say, you know, I'm not racist. Right. Um, and, and perhaps don't even realize um, what their own subconscious prejudices may be. Yeah. And, yeah. and I, I, I can say that I, having been um, sought out by the University of Utah to work on the School of Music, it's really interesting because they were and still are actively looking for diverse candidates. Yeah. And so when they went to hire me, I have to think I crossed off two boxes <laughs> Um, mm -hmm. and made it easy for them perhaps, you know? So it's, it's an interesting yeah, it's, conundrum. It is really a challenge. And I understand how there are, I, you know, I have a friend who's a white male and he, he, I think he does feel threatened by minorities and people of color. He feels like, 
well, is so-and-so getting this position just because of, the, of their racial background? Right. And right. that's that, and especially in the arts world um, where you have theater and uh, visual arts. Um, and for example, I was cast in a music video recently um, and I was like, oh, this is great. How'd you hear about me? And, um, and then when I, it, <laughs> somehow it came up, but they needed like a black person in the quartet. <laughs> And I was like, oh, is that why you're calling me? Or is it because I'm actually like a qualified musician? And I think, you know, in those situations, it's kind of both. And, yeah. and that's a, it's, it's just a strange thing to navigate. Um, but again, like I said, when people are looking for diversity, there is value in that. And I think that it does help people to see um, minorities represented in the media. I agree with you. I so with you. I, I was comfortable with being um, with that gig and being cast in that position. I'm, I'm um, right. But you know, going back to this audition experience, I had a friend who asked me once, um, who, who's known me for a long time, but she was like, did you get principal base, like just because you're black? And I was like, actually, <laughs> I've practiced and worked extremely hard since I was eight years old yeah. playing the bass. And this was, you know, in many cases, these are blind auditions. And yeah. I told her about the specific audition experience, but, um, you know, it's just, it's hard to, to tell sometimes how, how you're being viewed. Right. And, um, there's an interesting experiment that uh, I have a, I have a photo, sorry, let me know if I'm talking too much. I know okay. we have more people to, to talk, but I did want to mention this one thing. I, I have a stock photo that my sister took. She's a photographer. And so my stock photo is available for any company, anyone to purchase and use on their websites. And interestingly enough, you know, here I am this multiracial individual and my photo has been used on websites, including Planned Parenthood, a women's shelter for sexually abused women, um, ho homelessness, <laughs> uh, you know, is your wow. housing secure? I've been on a, a bus, uh, a bus stop at sign, a huge sign at a bus stop that um, asks if your kids are on marijuana, if you're, it's about drug use. And then I was on the, the Center for Disease Control during STD Awareness Month. Oh, no. And it's um, so, so that, you know, that just shows that like, when people look at, at someone who looks like me, it's like they assume the word, <laughs> they just might as, I don't know, you can't tell. Yeah. But when you look at it statistically, if you see where my image has ended up, just from the looks of my face, you see a lot of negative connotations with people yeah. who are brown. And so I feel that I'm always in every situation, every time I meet someone new, in any time I have a new job, any time I'm meeting a new employer, I feel that I have to prove my intelligence and worthiness right. to overcome any kind of prejudice that may exist, whether whether it does or not. Yeah. I feel the need to constantly, um, like prove prove myself. Yeah, you have to like, always be better better than everybody else. Like put your best foot forward. Um, you know, look your best, dress your best, just. Uh, Right. That first impression can make a really big difference. And I so agree. I have felt that since moving to Utah, where every time I meet someone new, I really have to open my mouth, project that I am a worthy individual. Yeah. Wow. Thank you, Liz, so, so much for sharing that. I, and I can, I can completely understand where you are. And I'd like to ask Isaiah to weigh in, um, you know, as somebody who's been in Salt Lake his whole life, as opposed to having moved there three years ago, um, and as a black uh, musician, what, what, are, what are your experiences in, in this realm? Oh, I was chomping at the bit for this. Uh, oh, good. So I can relate to what Liz is talking about in so far as not just in the West, but in America in general, there is this rife need, and I'm not sure why, 
but there's this rife need to, I don't want to use the term whitewash, but it's definitely a rewriting of history to make it appear as though African-American culture or African descendant culture has had very little to do with um, the forwarding of America as a society and as a culture. And um, one of the things that I notice as a jazz musician here in Salt Lake is there aren't very many black people playing jazz and jazz is an Afro-American art form. It was born in New Orleans and it was born of black people. And it's very interesting to me that I live in a place where jazz for the most part is associated with old white men. It just is. And so um, it's very interesting that, you know, especially even with the connotation of jazz, it's looked at, it, it has a certain vibe, it has a certain feel to it. Um, it evokes a certain time period. But when that time period is spoken of, very, very little do you ever hear um, or see the representation of what that really was like. And what you'll see if you go back in history and look is you'll see tons of African-American musicians in reputable orchestras and bandstands and dance halls. Bebop was invented to actually get away from the ballroom life. That's how bebop came about. You know, these musicians that spent their days playing in dance halls and playing dance music that probably they weren't that interested in could go down to New York and and play what they really felt inside their soul. But the music has always been sort of rhythmically driven. And I personally, as a musician, resonate with what Miles Davis said about this very issue that kind of Liz kind of brought up. In Europe and in the classical tradition, especially when you're a, a black American musician and you go to Europe, what Miles was saying is that when you go over there, you're treated differently if you play jazz. In other words, you have a concept mm -hmm. and you have um, a musical concept, a compositional concept, a rhythmic concept that not that your that European composers don't have. Yeah. And um, he said here in America, what it means is that you're in inward and you're playing an instrument that you didn't study. <laughs> and so the natural implication is, is that like it's that black people can play naturally bluesy music just because they have the blues, you know, or just because we were oppressed or just because we came from being oppressed to having to rise above that. That's not the case. Um, musicians are musicians first. And so they have to study. You have to get some kind of formal training. You have to, you know, learn your music theory, learn your ear training, go through the paces, pay your dues on the job circuit. I remember one time my mom, and this was, I was well into my career as a musician. I was like 14, 15 years old. I had my first professional gig when I was 12. So I had been doing this for a minute. And my mom worked downtown at what is now uh, the City Creek Mall. She worked on the 11th floor. And I met her there one day to go to lunch. And this, uh, one of her coworkers was a white male, uh, came up and was, you know, while I was talking to my mom and my mom stopped and said, oh, this is my son. And after introducing me to this man, the man looked at me and he says, so what sport do you play? And I caught him right there and I said, you are aware that we can do more than run and jump. <laughs> and I feel like the only way that we as, as a African-American sort of subculture within the American culture, the only way we can begin to be seen as human as we, as we start calling that out when it happens, because we, almost every great American musical uh, institution save the Latino contribution was made by African-Americans, you know, jazz, R&B, rock and roll, and even classical music. There have been, I mean, in the music schools, I'm, I don't think they teach about uh, the, the contributions that Quincy Jones has made to 20th century music or, um, uh, Duke Ellington. Duke Ellington is talked about, but he's not really studied. You know, he's he's not studied on par with the with a with a Stravinsky. 
So ask, I can, I can okay. relate to that. Let me ask you something. What's yes. really curious to me is that when, when, when we were talking with Coco, he was talking about how he doesn't really have a lot of competition for yeah. the salsa music. And yeah. if I were to interpret that, I would say he's considered a master of salsa music mm -hmm. by virtue of his culture and tradition from where he comes, all of that. So in other words, he's thought of as a master of that music. How is it that you don't enjoy the same treatment here um, as a master say of jazz or, or whatever, whatever it is that you're putting out there? Well, because first of all, um, it's not seen as an ethnic art form. It's not, it's not taught in the collegiate, even when I was going to school in the, uh, I guess I was going to the university about 2002 or so, give or, give or take. And when I came in through the program, I came in as a composition major, but I kind of walked it through the jazz program. And um, jazz was looked at, and I think music in general was looked at as kind of, well, we have all these great contributions by all these composers, but the but the sort of ethno background of where they came from to make that music is not seen as part and parcel of the total project. In other words, if nobody listens to Beethoven and automatically points to the fact that what he wrote was in German style because he was German. You know, nobody, said, nobody points to the fact that he was born in Bonn, Germany or the fact that Mozart was born in Salzburg, Austria. The, the, these are just footnote facts. But if you think about um, musicians, we're all byproducts of where we grew up. I grew up here in Salt Lake. You know, so there is that sense of when composers are writing about life, they're writing from the perspective and the world around them. And I came up in a world where, first of all, there's not that many black people here. And because we're, there are not that many of us here, we tend to get looked at as though we're invisible. Or it's amazing that we can do certain skills when there may not have been resources available to us or afforded us because we're black. See, it's, it's like Liz was saying, there is automatically the association with black with everything that is base level, you know, yeah. poor, uh, crime, you know, delinquent behavior, what, what have you. And as I said before, I think it has to do with the fact that there is a, a, a rife rewriting of history that's going on to try to suggest that we didn't do anything great. But I, I, I would say, you know, that Kind of Blue was one of those albums that Miles Davis did that changed the direction of modern 20th century music. That is a fact. Yeah. But until it's taught on par with what Beethoven did, what Bach did, until it's given that equal platform, you're going to continue to see artists like myself get looked over or um, sort of highlighted as he's this master musician and he happens to be black <laughs> kind of thing. So yeah. Isaiah, thank you so, so much. My gosh. Can I, I speak really, to that for just a second? I, I was just going to ask you, Lita. Yes, <laughs> yes, please. I just wanted to say briefly, so there's a there's a video that I that I want to share. I I do want to say I have some tech issues happening with my computer. And if I split my screen, I'll lose my Zoom. Got it. So I can't go to YouTube right now to find that and share it. If anybody else knows what I'm talking about, I'd love it if they could throw it in there. Literally, the title is something like, you know, music theory is white supremacist, um, something. Oh, like that. yes. It's yes. it's fantastic. But what I wanted to to say was I recently um, was asked to speak with our Boise State University um, music department, and we had a really encouraging discussion about race in the music department. And and I spoke to a couple of those kinds of issues that Isaiah was mentioning. Like um, when I took my music history class, I took it in the summer. So it was a little bit condensed, but still in the entire summer, we didn't talk about a single black composer. And it really left me with that feeling like my people didn't contribute to music. <laughs> you know, so, I mean, it was just like we went, we did a, a history, you know, and um, 
there were a couple black composers that were in the textbook that I did saw when I looked independently on my own to be like, really no black people. But I mean, as far as like who we actually studied in the class and talked about and whose music samples we listened to and analyzed all of that, there was not a single person of color that was discussed in the class. And when I asked the professor about it at the end of class, he said something about, you know, we didn't have time in this class to cover everybody that's in the book, you know, so it was kind of a, a lame answer, but also the book itself was completely <clears throat> based yeah. on a white supremacist view of, of who is important in this history of music. Right. You know, and it's all based on these, you know, fairly small lens of, um, yes. of these white composers. But I did want to just say from that, at the end of the discussion, when, pe when people were talking about what can they do about it, it was really encouraging to see how many students and even professors were talking about the need for a total revamping of the curriculum of, you know, who's being included, why are the white lenses those, why, why is that being the determinant of the standard of music and the this and the that. And it just seemed like there was a lot of talk being generated about trying to make a shift in that. Um, so anyway, that was, it was just I, nice to hear that conversation happening. I really appreciate that. And I can tell you that um, at the School of Music at the University of Utah, we are having those discussions as well. And we are talking about how the ways in which we can um, really try to expand that view in a much more holistic way um, to include a lot uh, more that was contributed, you know, through our history. And uh, so, I mean, frustrating as it is, the conversations are starting, they're not finished, they haven't really created necessarily a lot of change yet, but I think they will. But my question for you now, Lita, is what do you think that we as artists, not as educators, but we as artists, what do you think that we can do um, to, to help expand this view, to help um, ameliorate the situation for minority artists? What do you think we can do? I'm a little bit, of, um, I am at a bit of a crossroads and I'll be curious to see what the other panelists say about this. Thus far in my life, I have moved forward with this idea of kind of working within the systems and creating what I'm doing within the systems to yeah. try to expand. And I have started to shift more and more to feeling like um, the limitations of those systems and who created those systems and who's the gatekeepers of those systems, all of that kills my creativity and, yeah. and that maybe it's just about bypassing those systems entirely and creating our own, creating our own networks, yep. creating our own platforms just doing our thing, sharing our thing, and not yep. trying to do it in a way that's going to be supported or understood by dominant culture, yep. but just creating our own thing. I, I love that answer. And I, for one, um, as a performing artist, I consider uh, myself to be an entrepreneur. And I think, you know, with all of my young uh, singers in my studio now, this is what I'm pushing. You must be entrepreneurial. You know, we can't really rely on, you know, the Met to call me up and say, hey, we want you to sing blah, blah, blah. You know, I've created my own version of Carmen for one person um, because I got so sick and tired of other people telling me who she is and, and how I should play her. And so I, you know, I thought, well, to heck with all y'all. <laughs> I'm just going to take my own version. And Brooke was kind enough to let me bring it here to Salt Lake a couple of years ago. So um yeah, I agree with you. I think we have to uh, find ways to bypass the system. And I frankly think, I wonder if we're gonna look back at this pandemic era when all of a sudden everything was online, if that will seem like some sort of uh, equalizing moment. I don't know, but we all have a lot more um, voice maybe available if we will make the videos, if we will do, you know, what needs to be done for the online platform. I, I wonder, you know, as we look back, Liz, what is your thought on, on all of this and, and what we can do as artists to, to better the situation? Oh, yes. Uh, um, I have a couple thoughts, but as, as you're talking about, you know, um, well, so, so when the pandemic hit, um, and then shortly afterward, um, you know, George Floyd was killed. And then I just feel like the whole world blew up um but i noticed that online you know we've we've all been online and wrapped up in social media for years but but even more now than ever 
And I noticed that um, on Facebook and Instagram and on these social media platforms, people are reposting a lot of thoughts. They're finding their their influences out there, and then they they and people um, are sharing, resharing, and reposting um, thoughts from these influencers. And when when I started noticing that happening more than ever, especially on the topic of social justice, um, I made a decision that because I am an artist and a creative and I believe in the power of my own creativity, that I would not repost others, other people's stuff. And I would put out my own original thoughts and responses. And I think that when you are an artist, um, actually I heard this on NPR with, on an interview with Laura Downs, who has a new program um, interv interviewing like black musicians. Um, but she put out this idea and I totally agree with this and I totally see that it's true. Here I am passing on somebody else's. Um, <laughs> but so, so it's a thing, but, but um, when you are an artist or a musician, um, it's like you, you inevitably become, and you naturally sort of are an activist and because artists respond to the world around them and they, they, they embed their own thoughts and and feelings and and uh, emotions and whatever the response is, it becomes embodied in the art that you create and that you put forward. And so um, this has been a really interesting time when um, I've been asked to perform at events, for example, um, Salt Lake City, um, put on their first Juneteenth in arts performance to celebrate Juneteenth. And um, I was, it was an honor to participate in that first um, concert. And um, it was, it was such a unique opportunity to share a piece of music and perform um, like with, in response to what's happening in the world, you know, um, in a very direct way. Um, so I, I just think it's a really important, it's a, it's a real like, um, oh, how do you, how would you phrase this? Like just, it's part of your job as a, as an artist, you know, yeah. like it, you just, you just end up becoming, um, you know, our job is to speak to our communities and, and, and be influencers and influence people through art and music. And yeah. uh, it's a, it's a powerful thing. And I wonder if as um, minority artists doing our minority art, I mean, my father was a, an expert in Spanish American folk music and he made a couple records. And um, so I've, you know, sort of taken up that mantle to a certain degree. Um, but it's funny because as a classical musician predominantly, I don't, I, I want to, I think I want to build on what you've said, Liz, and I want to be more of an activist. As a, as a classical musician, in many ways, I am reinterpreting. I'm posting somebody else's stuff. Ah! That's okay. Right? That's totally it is okay. It is okay. Because no. there's so many brilliant people out there. But right. I, also, I also know and believe that all of us have valuable thoughts to share. Yeah. So I do yeah. hear, not just from the, the top influencers, but I want to hear from people like like you guys, and that's what's yeah. so cool about doing this panel. I know, you right? Just nailed it. Like this is what this <laughs> is about: having conversations with people in your community about your community. This is great, this Coco. Is great. I I want to ask you something. Yeah. So you're making this new album, which I cannot wait to immerse myself in. I'm Thank I'm you. very excited, um, and I want to ask you. Um, first of all, how do you think that you, as um, a Latino artist um, are being influenced by living here in the Mountain West. Has that come through your music? And do you feel at the same time, like maybe you're using your music as your activism here in the Mountain West? Does that make sense? I mean, I, yes. it, could, it could go both ways. It could be both at the same time. What do you think? Yes, I'm using it as uh, activism, like you're saying. Great. And. Uh, taking the best, you know, like I know that, yeah, there is, you know, facts, you know, or people that look at, you know, ah, Latino music or sometimes, you know, or, or the, when they hear it, actually, they like it. They say, <laughs> I, I just want to show them, you know, the difference that yeah. it's not all 
certain kind of music is there is different music and I sent a, a, one of my sons to a co-worker the other day and he was like, wow, you don't understand anything, but this is good. <laughs> so I, I, would, I, I, would love, I would love to uh, see what you're saying, but I mean, yeah. I love it. And, yeah. and I try to see the positive side in everything, you know, like being a minority, I, I want to show the roots. I want to show my, you know, the music. Uh, now I'm creating uh, a lot of positive words in my music bless you because a lot of the music now is all like bad words and you know sex and oh, things and I, and i'm changing that I'm, I'm writing you know a lot of these songs are, are my own compositions and oh, cool, cool. i'm that's putting good good tasks positive thoughts you know uh good messages on this oh, i love that it's so important now more than ever let me ask you have you considered um doing any of your new pieces in english you know, I thought about it. I thought about doing one English, one one song in English, so they can hear what I'm saying. You I know, mean, and, and but but also, you know, it's interesting because I have the same problem in opera. The same problem. They're like, "Wow, that sounds pretty cool," but I don't understand what you're saying. You know, so I, I have the same problem. But um, maybe by putting one song in English, that serves as a gateway, right? It does. I That's mean, kind of how Gloria Stefan and a lot of people did. You know, put in English songs, and then they can cross the two words. It really, it's, it, works. <laughs> it's, it works really well for, for me as a classical musician, you know? Yeah, and I, I wanna, so, one of those songs, I'm, I've been thinking about it and I, it's a salsa style, everything. I just need to put a lyrics and yeah. my accent is not so good, but you know, but I try. <laughs> it's cute. We love that. We love that accent. <laughs> and I think, you know, I mean, it's just something to consider. It's, we're trying to, to bridge the gaps, right? Yeah. We're trying to help, um, educate people in a way as, as artists, we, we are also educators and, but to also to bring them in, if, if there are too many barriers, yep. you know, then they're not going to want to even try. Right. It's right? true. It's true. Yeah, absolutely. But, but as you say, they hear it and they're like, Oh, I like that. What if and you I play in festivals and they all dancing, you know, they love yes. it, but a lot of times they can understand what I'm saying. Right. And it, you know what the, the truth of the matter is, especially when it comes to opera too, I don't think it matters. I think they get the gist of it, but it bothers them. It bothers them. And so what if we make a few gestures in their direction it's true. and maybe they'll come further this way, right? No, it is true. I, I, I owe you one song. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Man, not, I'm the winner of today. I need, I need all your help in the lyrics. <laughs> no problem. No problem, Coco, I'm here for you. Podemos hablar. Uh, en, en español para empezar y después en inglés. The translation, right? Right, no problem. <laughs> I'll, I'll look you up for the help in translating okay. the song. Right? I'm with you. I'm with you, Coco. You, you can count on me. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, Isaiah, what do you do as an artist? What do you do to kind of, kind of ah. spread the good word, as it will? Well, I think that uh, one of the things I always try to do, because my understanding is, is that as artists, we are all, we also, as you said, we're educators. Yeah. So because we stand on the shoulders of the people who did it before us, um, we have a responsibility to that as we are telling our story on the stage, we tell their story on the stage so that people have a historical context for why we're coming at them the way we're coming at them. I did a show. Um, I've done several concerts uh, for excellence in the community. I don't know if you've heard of that or. Yes, yeah. In yeah. fact, I tried to ask them to do my holidays from home concert, but that didn't. There you go. <laughs> so I've done several of these. I've done um, most of them as a side men with other artists, but I did one show back in February for Black History Month, and with what with what all the panelists have saying it, have been saying, it's led me to this one conclusion. Um, we as people of color within the various communities of people of color, Black, Latino, Afro-Latino, what have you, um, we have to begin to redefine ourselves outside the context of what was placed on us. For instance, um, so I did the show, I did this show in February on, in Black History Month, and I wanted to uh, because this was around the time when, you know, everything was going wild with like 
the Black Lives Matter movement was just starting to really gain momentum and people were starting to get really jazzed about it. And I'd made the decision that I wanted to remind America of its history, of where it really comes from. And I, and this, and actually, no, this was before that, because I think we, I think the last show that they had an audience, no, I think it was February. So anyway, the people were there and um, I took a moment of the show and I said, I really want to kind of bother the audience a little bit. And I know that sounds weird, but I don't think we're living up to our potential as artists if we don't make our audience sit with some uncomfortable moments sometimes so that they can grow from it. So what I did was I sang the national anthem of the United States, but I sang the third verse and the fourth verse, not the first to begin with. And that's because we're not aware that there's this context placed on us that we didn't write. We didn't write the narrative of who we are in this country as a people. It was written for us and then imposed on us. And then we were told to go out and live it. And there's a line in the third, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a line in the third stanza that says, uh, no refuge can save the hireling or slave from the terror or, of night or the gloom of the grave. So Francis Scott Key, who was the writer of that poem that then became our national anthem, was actually um, dissing slaves. <laughs> like he was, he was dissing the slaves that were willing to defect over to Britain to fight in the War of 1812 because the British promised those enslaved Africans their freedom if they would fight against the Americans who had enslaved them. And so that third line talks about that, but we never dis it, it never gets brought up, it's never discussed. And so at the end of that, after I sang that third stanza, then I had everybody sing the first verse together as a group. And I had people coming up to me afterwards saying, that song, the national anthem carries so much more weight for me now than it did before you did what you did. So I think we have a responsibility as artists to rewrite the narrative of America, especially being people of color, because we've contributed so much to this country. Um, the other thing I think that we can do maybe, and this is just, you can take it or leave it. I often wonder if we shouldn't stop using the word minority to describe ourselves because insofar as our contributions to culture to music, to art, to literature, to dance, to anything that is of sort of the esoterics of American society, there is nothing minor about us. And I don't care whether you're black or Latino, there is nothing minor about us and what we have done. I love Selena Quintanilla Perez. I love her. I love her as an artist. I love what she's done. And um, I would just say that, um, being being in the relationship I am with somebody who's of, of Afro-Latino culture, um, it's taught me even to redefine what it means to be black. You know, we have to redefine what blackness is. Blackness isn't just African American. Black is just a skin color. And and it just so happens that most of us that are in parts of, of this country and parts of South America and Central America and the Caribbean happen to share the same skin color. And we've all contributed to what this Western world means. So I think that as we continue to create um, and we continue to inspire ourselves as well as the world around us, one of the things we need to be responsible for is redefining as we represent ourselves on the stage and on the screen, what we are. And it, it, it's not necessarily a minority. It's not anything that's been placed on us except what we want to place on ourselves. And to be courageous enough to stand up and say it. And, yeah. and, and to be respectful enough to not necessarily thrust it in people's faces with spit and hate, but no. rather to simply, you know, as enlightened people do. Music, 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 art, dance, anything that expresses the human body in some degree is an act of love. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes love comes with growing pains. And in order for us to grow to be more than what we are, those growing pains sometimes are necessary. They're never pleasant, otherwise they wouldn't be called pains but they are necessary for our growth. And I, that's for all of us. I mean, 
That's for the people who we want us to recognize us as human, but it's also for us as a culture to deal with, you know, some of the internal um, psychological and emotional damage that we all are kind of dealing with to some degree because of European colonialization. I mean, we're all affected by that. We're all affected by that. In some ways, we're all kind of damaged by that. Yeah. And so the only way that we can begin to heal and then recognize art is just art, no matter who makes it, is redefine what it is, you know, to be an artist. You know, I don't have to be uh, Isaiah Smith, you know, black jazz pianist. I could just be Isaiah Smith musician, yeah. you know, and he happens to be medium brown complected, but that, yeah. what, so what, you yeah, know? So what, exactly. Lita, tell me, tell me what, how has this, crazy pandemic been affecting you your art you talk about this wonderful space where you're doing all of this um art work with others and therapy and whatnot i'm picturing it because i want to go there and i want to be just surrounded by all y'all and you know and 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 but we're in the middle of a pandemic how what are you doing how are you bringing that forward so the things for me that got impacted by COVID are all of my classes. So all of my contracts with the school, schools. Um, also, I do a, a civic engagement whole thing with our city hall where third grade classes come in and I try to get them riled up and interested in becoming part of the system or becoming, using their voices because yeah. kids, kids can come to city council meetings and speak out. They don't have to be able to vote. So I'm trying to get the kids riled up. Yeah. So like all of that got canceled. Um, I Just didn't do any camps, most. I didn't do any acting camps or any of those kinds of things. So that that's the way that COVID impacted me the most. Luckily, my actual studio is a large enough room that I'm already six feet away from people. So my private lessons didn't weren't impacted. About half of them went remote for a little while, but are back because okay. I I bought a eight foot screen guard that's between me and my students and. Um, the biggest shifts for me have been a, a real influx of black people seeking counseling because I'm one of the only black therapists in the entire city. And so my, um, so I've been doing, you know, everything I can to accommodate people's schedules and just fit everybody, yeah. everybody in. So that has been a beautiful blessing yeah. for me to, 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 to be, be able to provide that. Need, yeah. um, but it's also, you know, just trying to figure that out. And then starting my radio show, that was a pandemic that that started because of this, because luckily we had, and this is a, a beautiful example of allyship to me, one of the DJs at the Radio Boise, it just became very clear to him that he, he needed to give his space and he did like a two or three hour show a week. And that he wanted to basically shut up. He wanted to just give his space to black voices Oh so wow! He asked me to, you know, just help find. Was it? Was there anybody who wanted to? Oh wow! Do something, play music, whatever. He's like, I just feel like I need to step back for a while. And so, oh. for several weeks, I was trying to help wow. plug people into his show. And then at one point, the station just approached me about what I like to do my own show because I've been working with the station in different capacities. Um, and in other years, I probably would. I just it would have been overwhelmed. But but yeah. it felt like yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, I have things to say. I have a lot of people whose voices I want to amplify music. Also, I think I just, because I just depressed and um, music to me is like the one safe place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there's just so much in the world right now that feels unbearable to me. Yeah, we need it now more than ever. Yeah. And I, and with all of the things going on in my life, focusing hours and hours of attention on researching other black artists and listening to their music and what is everybody else doing? That's not necessarily something I would do just in regular world. But now that I have this radio show, every week is about that, is finding new artists and listening to their music and seeing what else is going on out there. And it's it's been a very amazing place for me to um, kind of cocoon myself yeah. and yeah. just focus on this amazing stuff that black and brown folks are doing and creating and it inspires me. Um, so that's how the pandemic has really shifted what I'm doing. You're making the most of it. I love that, Lita. Liz, talk to me. What about you, girl? I mean, I get it. The Ballet West is not able to do its thing. So where are you, where are you putting it? Are you, are you putting more of it into to Luna? 
Well, I mean, I think uh, Lita mentioned, um, I had a the same thing. Like I had a lot of gigs canceled when the pandemic Thank went you. down. Um, like typically I take my, like my music and movement program for kids. Um, I do a musical program usually at libraries and the main Salt Lake City Library. And so um, the, all the, all the library is closed. <laughs> so um, my gigs were canceled and then the ballet, the orchestra, we can't social distance in the pit. Yeah. So there's not really a, a practical way or way that they've figured out for us to perform with the dancers. The dancers are still active, but I know that even them, um, their contracts are being adjusted um, because of the pandemic. So it's a really challenging time to be a performer, you know, a li yeah. a live, re rely one who relies on live performance. Yeah. And, um, but then I found uh, that as a result, I mean, I, 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 I've done a couple things. We did some outdoor performing. I put on a porch recital on my front porch. Great. And people just brought lawn chairs. <laughs> Great. I played for people. There's another band. Uh, there's, a, there's a bluegrass group that performs every Tuesday on our street. Wow. But here we're coming into, it's getting colder, winter is coming. And so, you know, yeah. what are we gonna do in the, in the winter that it becomes kind of not as easy to perform outdoors. But, you know, here we have this digital movement. Like here we are having this <laughs> in Zoom, which is so cool. So yep. huge props to Zoom. Yeah, yeah. We've we got, got like a monopoly right now on this kind of thing, but, um, um, I've, for the first time ever, I was approached by the library to, to produce videos. Videos, yeah. Yeah, and that, so that's a thing, like getting into yeah. the video, um, doing more stuff with video and that. Um, but then this is a time when I've found, you know, as we're all, you know, we started quarantining, we've, we've all been spending much more time at home and indoors and I feel like there's kind of no better time to create. Mm -hmm. So while you may not be out there performing, mm -hmm. this is the like a great time to really sit down and be introspective, like to sit with your introspect introspection is that a word? Yeah. Um, and and create and respond and respond and and um, and experience. Li like liveliness in that way. I love that you said respond to uh, Liz, because I think, you know, we as artists, we sort of, that, that's why we're here. We're here to express the human experience, right? And I don't know about you guys, actually I'd, I can guess, but I'm full of emotion like every day, up and down rolling like a roller coaster. And, you know, I mean, it's not fun to live through uh, some of those but they're the fodder for our creativity too. So people um, do the most amazing things when they're under stress or yep. when they're depressed or they're going through a break yeah. or whatever. Like the amount of amazing breakup music out there is <laughs> awesome. Yes. And and Coco, is that why this album is happening now? Because yes, a lot of free time. <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. And creating, you know, creating. Yeah. Like what, um, what kinds of you're, the song lyrics that you're delivering right now, they're really positive messages. Are they, are any of them affected by the pandemic at all? Or are you? One, one is called Go Forward with Faith. Wow. Adelante y con fe. Con fe. Forward and with faith. Wow. So it talks about that, like, you know, um, dream, you know, go forward. If things are yeah. happening, if you fall, get up again, you know, but in a salsa oh, rhythm oh. and it's really fun. Bravo, bravo, we need but, uh, that. Con fe, and most of the other ones are love songs because I'm very romantic. <laughs> no, you're kidding. That's a romantic. A, a Latino romantic, no, pero no. <laughs> one called uh, uh, Me Enamoré, I Fall in Love. Another one, uh, you know, Little by Little, like I will read, you know, yeah. Little by Little, it's called like that. <laughs> Wonderful, well, uh, we can use yeah, those so, at any time. Uh, you know, I, uh, Marty, I see, love you like this. So yeah, it's, wow. and I did one for God too. You know, I, I one salsa is called Gracias, mi Dios. 
Ah, sí, thank sí. Thank you, my Lord. Sí, sí. And uh, it's just a beautiful salsa, but thanking God for everything, you know, for giving us everything in life. Gratitude. That's such a beautiful place to be. Are you are you able to perform at all during this time, Coco, yeah. or...? We did a few gigs, but uh, for the communities, you know, like Daybreak, Park City, Heber, uh, but most shows got canceled, but yeah. they were doing that like in April or May because yeah. they wanted people to, people were tired to be home and they wanted to bring a little joy and happiness sure. and they bring out their chairs and, you know, out mm -hmm. listening in the streets, keeping distance. Yeah, yeah. But uh, I think they, they stopped doing it. So, I yeah. mean, and it's okay and now, the weather is changing and stuff too, you know. So. Well, at least at least you're turning your creativities into your studio and and you're going to we gotta do a virtual. We gotta do a virtual concert. Yes, all of us. Sign me up. I'm with you. A virtual concert. We're gonna excellent. Do I think that's great. I think we have everything covered. Yeah. Um, Isaiah, what are you able to perform at all right now, doll? Or are you just uh, uh surprisingly um. Well, I, I mean, gigging was 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 hit the, the hardest. Like in Nashville, like being able to physically go out and perform. Of course, that was hit the hardest. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to retain sort of one steady gig at uh, at Hopkins Brewery and Sugar House every Thursday um, at eight o'clock, and we're only there for like two hours at, at most. Right. So, um, but even now, I think given you know the weather change and and all of that, it's probably going to have to kind of reevaluate that a little bit. Um, I will say though, and it's uh, and I think it was was it Lita? I think it was either Lita or Liz that spoke to the fact that this is the best time now to be creative. So um, yeah. after after the George Floyd uh, lynching, I had uh, I was so incensed by that that I went. I lock, I have a studio, you can't see it, but it's like in my apartment, it's just right over there. And I went in there and I locked myself in there for about two days. And I came up with two songs that uh, eventually I'm gonna like record and put out there. And the first one was called um, uh, Freedom. Actually I did three. The first one was called Freedom and the, the Freedom was written in response to um, you know, people were basically getting cabin fever from the pandemic and losing their minds and I can't go outside and I can't hug human beings. I can't have human contact. I'm ready to pull my hair out. And I basically just got to that still voice inside and said to myself, you know what? Freedom is a state of mind. So you got to, you have to, you have to decide that even though you're confined to the four walls, you're still free. You're as free as you want to be. Then I wrote a second song called Solace, which meant that, you know, we were being inundated with people's opinions and vitriol about the situation in the White House and the pandemic and people are just responding in anger because we don't know what else to do really except respond in anger and I said well you know what I want to go back to hearing my own voice I want to hear my own feedback I want to hear my own how I feel about things so I saw this was kind of written as a response but the big one was after the George uh, the George Floyd lynching, I wrote this song called I Can't Breathe. And um, it's written in the style of, I guess for lack of a word, better word, it feels kind of like one of those chain gang songs that you might have heard, you know, chain gangs from the 20s and 30s that they're, you know, they're driving the railroad spikes or the rails in the rail system and they're keeping rhythm, but they're singing to pass away the tedium it's written in that style and I was trying to give George Floyd an articulation that I felt that he didn't have because of the situation he was in at the time and you know who can speak when a knee is on your when, when a knee is on your windpipe for eight minutes and 46 seconds so I felt that because he couldn't speak I would speak Oh, as an yeah. artist for him and to not only his situation, but for what we all go through as people of color to some degree, the amount of, of abuse and isolation and loneliness that then it gets rechanneled into anger. Cause I, I hear it all the time, you know, people uh, about black people, I've heard it said quite, you know, they're just so angry and it's like, well, that there's a reason for that. Yeah. You know, it comes, it comes from somewhere. It's not just yeah. out of the blue. And when you are, 
when you're pressed and you feel like you don't have a voice, mm -hmm. you know, you, it, it manifests in violence. So the anger that I was feeling towards the situation, my response, and I love that word, I think, was it Liz that said response? Mm -hmm. I, I love that oh, word response yeah. because I feel like in today's society too, and that was my response. Rather than react to it with anger, right. I responded to it thoughtfully with, with a loving with a loving act to, to say, hey, this is what we're dealing with. So I am working on um, I'm I'm working on my um, my my solo project because I spent a lot of time, you know, as a sideman or helping other people with yeah, the projects. Yeah. So, but that look look for that, look for that to come okay. down the pipe. We will be looking for that. I can <laughs> promise you that, Isaiah. Wow, thank you. And guys, you know, we're, we're, again, I mean, I feel ever more blessed now um, having spent this time with you. We're coming toward the end of our time together. And um, I want to just reiterate to our participants that, or the folks watching, that um, if they have any pressing questions, we can try to get to them. But there was a question that uh, someone asked having to do with, she, she would like to know from any of the panelists, um, what, if any of you have had to uh, move your creativity into ways that are not based on your formal training or your own culture? Have you had to kind of expand in other directions? Liz, did you wanna answer that one? <laughs> yeah, um, what's, what's cool, like, so when I was in, actually, since I was a kid, I wanted to be a, like a visual artist. I wanted to be a cartoonist, like an animator. And um, I took cartooning lessons and caricature lessons and watercolor lessons. And, and so when I was in high school, I, I really, I, I wanted to go in, I was always planning to go into painting and visual art. Huh. But then I was doing well on the string bass and I thought, oh, I can get a scholarship. And I ended up majoring in music, but um, visual art was always like my thing from, you know, even before wow. I started playing the bass. And what's been cool lately is I'm I'm getting more like work as a visual artist than I am <laughs> That's as awesome. a musician right now. So I, I painted um and, and a lot of it is related to the social justice movement as well. Like I I painted um I may have mentioned the the um I was on the team that painted the large Black Lives Matter yeah. mural in front of City Hall. Thank you. And uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, that was really a cool experience. And then that's led to other things. And um, I think I mentioned I'm painting a mural on the side of this uh, Utah Black History Museum school bus, or right. a converted school bus. And then I was commissioned to do a painting, a large portrait of Dr. King, Martin Luther King. Wow, fantastic. Uh, oh yeah, I, that, I will have to share that. Yeah, please. The, Don't keep us in the dark, girl. That's excellent. Um, yeah, so it's been really great to like be able to take some time doing something else that I really love yeah. that I wasn't expecting to do much of this year. And, um, you know, I, I feel like, you know, creativity pours out of us in different ways and in right. different mediums. And right. um, so I, I think that it's, not, I, I have I have been warned that to be multidisciplinary or to be, uh, you know, a jack of all trades, there's the potential to not be as good at each thing. And like, like for example, with this, the the visual arts, like I'm, I'm still, I would say that I'm at a high school level. But <laughs> I, I personally believe that it's really great to be interdisciplinary. I agree. So, um, be able to. Um, exercise your creativity in a variety of ways. Um, I was also gonna mention that I, I have started working on a collaboration with a professor, uh, Steve Ricks at BYU. Um, we're, we're writing a modern rap opera of sorts. Wow. <laughs> so I'm also doing some writing, some poetry, and some rap. Yeah. And we're gonna set that to some really crazy modern music and have some visual <laughs> elements and so, Hopefully that will premiere in fall of 2021. Oh yeah, so, oh, thanks. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting, uh, you know, we to, to, to try to work on a piece that addresses uh, racial injustice yeah, for the BYU audience is yeah. kind of unique challenge. challenging. Yeah, um, you can't like, I can't write rap with swearing in it. No. <laughs> You're cut off you're cut off but um you know so but it's it's a really cool opportunity to reach an audience that um 
that I think will benefit from yeah. that kind of art. That's fantastic, Liz. And so guys, we have like just three minutes is, um, and I know you guys are all doing things that are perhaps challenging you in various ways, but does anybody else want to add anything about directions you've had to go into that are not um, stemming from your formal training or? Well, I would say for me, all of the stuff that's requiring tech knowledge. Yeah. That's been a big stumbling block for me, you know, because the tech stuff just shuts down my creativity. <laughs> having to figure out some of the streaming things and some of yeah. the, if I would home recording or like just it, all of that stuff, there's just so much tech and streaming platforms. And there's just so much new stuff that it it's out there. I know I could be doing more than I'm doing, but I don't know how to utilize those things. And so just trying to kind of figure out that world for me has been a barrier. Are, are you, are you making headway though? I mean, it's, it's gone on longer than we thought it would. So are you able to keep going and, and learning more? My initial thought is like, no, because I'm thinking of things like home recording. Like I, I bought a new computer to do my radio show on yeah. and a audio interface. So that, yay, I can do this stuff. And then as it turns out, the computer I bought has such a loud fan that I literally can't record on into the computer. I, had, I would have to be in a completely different room in the house to, you know what I mean? So it's like, I'm making kind of rookie mistakes like yeah. that, yeah. you know? So, so probably I'm learning things and making progress, but to me, I'm just very well aware of the sure. fact that I still feel like I'm not able to do things that I know I have the skills to do, but I can't figure out the tech part of it, you know? Yeah. Well, if this goes on much longer, maybe you, <laughs> you'll be forced to make progress, like it or not. Um, I get you, I, I get you. I mean, teaching voice lessons online, you can imagine is like a nightmare every day. <laughs> but you know, we're making progress, it's very slow, but we're making progress. And Isaiah, are you, are you finding tech issues too? <laughs> uh, well, um, I, I use the time to, uh, focus more on the production side of what I, I do, you know, learning, learning logic, learning um, uh, Ableton Live. Um, thank God that I am with uh, an incredible girlfriend who <laughs> is teaching me how to branch over into the social uh, media side of making yourself known as an artist because yeah. and this is another thing too that I, as musicians we all probably should get better about sometimes we're so in the throes of creativity and making what we make but then we make it and then just sit on it and we don't put it out there um but i mean i've been getting education for the past seven months on how to filter your pictures and put yourself out there and what to post and where to put so I've been actually having a good I have been having a fairly good time of, of and I don't post as often as I should but I'm I'm getting better now about you know posting to Instagram and 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 understanding that I actually do have an audience on Instagram that follows me which if you want to follow me follow me on Izzy I Z Z Y underscore Smith S M I F F on Instagram you can go oh. check me out there sweet and, um, uh, I think Thank there's a link tree <laughs> there's thanks Liz there's a link tree there that will um send you to my SoundCloud um the mixes SoundCloud so you can hear what we do and what we're working on and, and also that sort of thing so that is also I have been cooking more so I've been fantastic I've been, I've been trying to get more a little bit more into like cooking in other words I make a mean catfish so if I throw in some Nola jazz and cook some catfish I'm good to go <laughs> coming over to your place Isaiah and I, I I confess I had an ulterior motive because I figured you probably were doing some some good tech stuff over there Isaiah and probably you too Coco and so uh oh, Lena, oh yeah sorry sorry yeah, if you if, if any of you include panelists included, like if you want uh, beat up. music or beat music for like your social yeah. media or website or whatever you want to use it for, email me um, Isaiah the Who at Gmail or, or find me on Instagram. Coco's already my boy. Like Coco, Coco <laughs> and I have performed <laughs> together, so Coco and I go go back a little bit. But <laughs> but yeah. Hit, Great. Hit, hit, Hit me up if you need beats for anything. I Thanks, will, I, will, I will gladly do it. 
Super. And I bet, Lita, if you, if you had questions about how to get the recording going and everything, you know, we got to tap into our friends. That's what we, that's what we got to do. Right. And if, if this panel told us anything is that we're all friends and we can absolutely learn from each other and, and build on what the other one is doing. And, you know, I mean, sometimes I feel like it's, my little effort at making the world a better place seems awfully small, but you know what? It's like that butterfly wing, right? Which causes the typhoon halfway around the world. It's, it's amazing that the little ripples, they really do get quite large and they touch an enormous number of people. So my wish for all of you, because you're just doing amazing, amazing things. And I feel blessed to be here with you. Please don't stop. Please find ways to keep doing the good work that you're doing, even in the midst of a global pandemic, guys. It's crazy that we're talking like that, but we are. And I just think that, you know, I know you guys agree with me that we need our art now more than we ever have in, in our lifetimes, I, I can say, because I'm probably older than all y'all. And I just think we need to find the ways to keep bringing it out there, being creative, being entrepreneurial, and being generous and being willing to go there and to respond. Thank you, Liz and Isaiah. Very, very important. We take in what happens. We feel what we're going to feel, but we choose how to respond. As artists, our response is really important, if I may say. Um, so bless you all. Thank you all so much. I'm sad that we've run out of time, but I'm deeply, deeply grateful for every one of you who has committed to being here with us today. And we're all just going to be, we're going to be finding ways to connect together and to make music together. And we have a concert date and I have a song to help you ride and we've got good things going on guys. It's great stuff. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Every one of you. I can't wait to greet you and hug, hug you in person. <laughs> thank you be good take good care of you please okay thank you, for having us. Thank you so much guys <laughs>